one of the wonderful things about the Papalotto Fellows Program is the fact that it spans different uh, subfields of physics and brings together scientists, theorists, and experimentalists, people working on instrumentation, those doing lab experiments, sometimes in the same field, so that there's a good deal of scientific uh, interaction uh, in the particular areas that we focus. At the same time, it's a way for the department to get an overview of emerging fields of physics and to see some of the emerging stars in those areas. And so we're very happy to have the second uh, presentation in a completely different area of uh, condensed matter physics by Karen McKayley. Thank you. So Laura was telling us that actually most of the elements are coming to us, to supernovae. I will tell you what happened to these elements once they are in, in Earth and what they can do. And I will tell you about new physics, which emerge when we are taking two boring insulators and combine them together, glue them together, and see what, what happens. That is actually quite common root in condensed matter of creating new physical phenomena. And that's to engineer new system and not necessarily study already existing one. Now, I will specifically talk about the case where, we, as I said, we are taking oxide insulators and glue them together. What has been seen is that many phenomena can occur at the interface. I will talk about specific material where the system become conducting. So there is a conducting layer which occur at the interface between the two band insulators, two insulators that we just glue together. Actually, Ed was speaking about connecting different fields. Last year, at this, this symposium, we had Luli, who were measuring this kind of system, and he showed that the system is not only conducting at the interface, but actually become magnetic, and we, we, when we are going to even lower temperature, it can become superconducting. So we were starting from something boring, or two boring materials, combined them together, and got something which is rich of physics. And that is quite surprising. If you want to think how much surprising, think about the, the, this analog. You are sitting at home, and you are hungry. You are going to your kitchen, taking two piece of, pieces of bread, and saying, OK, we will create a sandwich. Going to the refrigerator. Nothing. The refrigerator is empty. Very sad, but you're still hungry. So you say, OK, I will take and make a sandwich with nothing inside of it. OK, you're creating your very fancy or very sad sandwich, taking a bite, and suddenly, instead of having a boring sandwich, you discover that you have a very fancy one. Now, that will be indeed such a magic. I will try to explain you today the magic that makes this two boring insulator into a fancy sandwich or into a fancy physical system. Now, actually, when we think about combining two material, that is not new physics. Although the combining oxide insulator is new, combining regular two systems is quite old news. And the best example for that is silicon. When we think about silicon, we think our electronic devices in the computer, or in our cell phones, or everywhere around, actually, those days. But if we think about just a chunk of silicon, chunk of si silicon is quite boring material. It, it is semiconductor. We can understand it by band theory. But nothing more. It, it is not going to do what my computer can do. And, but as we were taught by Bardeen, Shockley, and Batten, who invented the transistor, in order to create something interesting out of this boring silicon, we need to create some interface between the silicon and other materials. So by combining, for example, silicon and silica, we can create all these devices around us that we use in everyday life. Now, if we go back to the sandwich ana analog, silicon was nice bread, and we got something nice in, the, in, in between. But if we will take even fancier bread, can we get something better? And that is the idea about these oxide interfaces. This fa family of oxide, oxide insulators, are actually quite known to us 
as having very strong interactions between the electrons. And as we know, strong interaction between electrons can lead to many interesting phenomena as superconductivity, magnetism, it can be ferromagnetism, it can be antiferromagnetism, it can be ferroelectric, and many others. So the question is what we are getting and how that plays any role in our oxide interface. I will speak about very specific oxide interface that was introduced almost 10 years ago, where lantanium, lantanium aluminate was gone on, ton, on top of strontium titanate. Now, to understand this material, we need first, oh, and what happened in the interface, we need first to look at each material separately. So let's look at strontium. It has very complicated structure, but the, what is important to us <coughs> that it has alternating layers of strontium and oxygen, and titanium and oxygen. If we are looking at the lantanium aluminate, it has a very similar structure, but now the alternating layers are layers of lanthanum and oxygen, and layers of aluminum and oxygen. Let's look what happens when we are starting with strontium titanate and growing layer by, la by layer of lanthanium aluminate on top of it. Now, it is important to notice if we are looking at the ionic composition of this material that strontium titanate has this layered structure that we saw before, and each layer is charge neutral. But when we are growing layer of lanthanium aluminate on it, unlike strontium titanate, lanthanium aluminate has one extra electron in the aluminum oxide layers per aluminum atom, and one missing electron in the lanthanum oxide layer per lanthanum atom. And therefore, you can think about putting this one layer or two layers on top of our strontium titanate as if we are putting a capacitor on top of our system. And as we know, when we have a capacitor, there is an electric field between the two plates of the capacitor. And therefore, there will be some voltage built up between the two layers. We can, of course, put another layer. Again, there will be electric field in between, and now the voltage between the two sides of our capacitor stack will just go. We can put another layer, and the voltage just keep going. Now, if we will stop here, the system will remain as, as is, and we are not going to see anything interesting in the system. It's going to stay, instead of two boring insulators, we got one boring insulator, nothing more. But if we will just add another layer, this voltage difference between the interface and the upper surface of the system is too high, and the system just becomes unstable. It cannot absorb this large difference in the voltage. In order to make it stabilize again, there is a charge that will be transferred from the upper surface to the interface. This charge will be half of the charge of the upper level will go into the interface. So now we will have at the interface combination of titanium atoms with three electrons missing and four electrons, plus four and plus three. As a consequence, the electric field now is going to zigzag between positive and negative values, and therefore the voltage now <coughs> is staying very close to zero. So we solve this kind of instability that is called polar catastrophe. All of the interesting physics that I'm going to speak about is actually coming from this surface, from this interface layer where all the charge were transferred to. And that one was explaining all what occurs at the interface from electrostatic, but we can see it also in experiment. We can see here measurement of the conductivity as a fu function of the number of layer of lanthanum aluminate. As long as there are three layers or, le or less, the system is not conducting, as I said, just insulating. However, at four layers and more, the system becomes conducting, and actually we can see that it's almost independent how many layers will be put on top of the strontium titanate. Now, since the conductivity of the system is quite good, actually comparable to silicon, people were starting to have all kinds of titan. Is it better than silicon? Are we beyond the era of silicon? Are we in the beginning of a new era of oxide? 
electronics instead of silicon electronics, and people were starting to think about applications. And one interesting application is to use the fact that when we have three layers of lanthanum illuminate, the system is insulating. But it's on the verge of being, <coughs> being conducting. And in order to make it conducting, we need slightly to polarize the, the system. And that can be done using water. So what they were doing, they were using water, writing the circuit. Wherever there is water, it becomes conducting. But since they can also remove the water drops from the system, they have a, a chance to erase the circuit and then just rewrite a new one. So you can think about it as etch a sketch for electronic circuit. Now, although there are already starting to be applications here for this material, there are still many open questions that I was trying to explain in this work. First one is related to the polar catastrophe. We were saying that due to the polar catastrophe, we expect half of the charge from the upper surface to go to the interface, or roughly half of the charge. So therefore, if we are going and just measuring the conductivity of this system, we should see that the conductivity is coming from certain amount of char charges that we know, certain amount of electrons that we know how many should be. However, when people were measuring that, they realized that they only measure roughly 10% of the electrons that we expected to see in, this, in these systems. Another open question is the origin of ferromagnetism in the system. And this measurement was done by Lully, who is a former Papalado fellow, and was talking about that just last year. And he was doing that in the lab of Freya Shui. He was measuring the magnetization as a function of magnetic field, obtaining a very large ferromagnetic moment in the system. <coughs> and this ferromagnetism is actually going to remain at very high temperatures. He also measured at the same system, as, again, as a function of magnetic field, the resistivity. Starting from high magnetic field, he, he saw that there is no, almost no change in the resistivity when he's in lowering the magnetic field. However, at certain magnetic field, the resistivity is going down to zero, and the system becomes superconducting. And of course, if you will now increase the magnetic field with the opposite sign, it will go back. Now, usually, a system that is both fer that is ferromagnetic would not like to be superconducting, or vice versa. So another question is to explain how can we understand the coexistence of superconductivity and ferromagnetism in this system. So let's jump to the explanation, and let's look at the interface layer. We said that we understand that electrons are going into the interface layer. So let us just focus on the titanium atoms at the interface layer. Roughly, they have half of the electron from the upper surface is going to the interface. So half of the atoms will have electrons, electron attached to them. Now, electrons like to move. So they should not be static. But if we will for a moment freeze our electrons, we can see that at any given moment, we'd expect many electrons to sit at the same atom. But electrons have charge, and therefore they don't wish to sit too close, close to each other. They repel each other. And if this repulsion is large enough, they want to sit as far as possible from each other. And that can be achieved if we don't let them move and instead of that, localize them in any second atom, titanium atom. Therefore, in that case, most, our electrons are not going to conduct. They are going to be an insulator. And when measurement of conductivity will be done, these electrons are not going to participate. And that's why we don't see most of the electrons, actually, when conductivity is measured. There will be other electrons that can conduct, and they wouldn't like to sit in this structure because they will interact very strongly with these electrons. But they can go and sit in the next titanium layer. <coughs> Let's put them from now on in green. So we have our localized electron, and we have our green electron, which can still conduct and give us some conductivity. 
Now we can go and try to explain the ferromagnetism. For that, we can look again <coughs> at our localized electron and attach to them their spin, their magnetic moment. In general, the spin can be pointing in any arbitrary direction. But if two electrons are sitting close to each other, they might interact and want their spin to point out in opposite direction. For that, since our electrons are quite far, let's look at how our localized one and our mobile electron will interact through their spin. So they want the spin to be in opposite direction, and therefore let's put it in opposite direction. But our mobile electron is not going to stay close to this localized electron. It's actually going to move to the next one. And now, again, it, won't, it wish to be anti-parallel to the localized one. So we can turn the spin of the mobile electron to be now in the new direction, but then when it will move, it will have to be pointing in again in a different direction. So it will be much easier to actually flip the direction of the spin of the localized one. So therefore, when our mobile electrons are moving along the sample, they are polarizing the localized electrons. And that's how we get our ferromagnet. All the spins are po po pointing to the same direction. Obviously, because all the localized spin are pointing to one direction, most of the mobile spin will point to the opposite direction, and we will have more mobile spin pointing in one direction than in the other direction. And that is not good for superconductivity. When we think about superconductivity, superconductivity will occur when electrons of opposite spins will form pairs, <coughs> what is known as Cooper pairs. But we, don't, we have more electrons of, let's say, upspin than downspin, so not all the electrons can actually pair. And these unpaired electrons are actually going to destroy the superconducting state, and if there are too many of them, we are not going to see any superconductivity. There is one solution that can make it still better. We can put all the Cooper pairs in parts of the sample, and in between them, put all the unpaired electrons. This kind, therefore, we will have area with large superconductivity, where Cooper pairs sit, and we will have area with small, low superconductivity or no superconductivity at all, where our unpaired electron will sit. This kind of structure is called full deferral Larkin, Larkin of Chinnikov state, or FFLO state, and that is somehow some kind of holy grail in condensed matter. People know that it ex should exist, but no one actually can uh, have been able to measure that. And one reason for that is that these FFLO state are usually very fragile. It's enough to have small and small amount of impurity, and it will immediately disappear. What we have shown, that in these oxide interfaces, there is opportunity to see a very stable FFLO state that is not going to be destroyed, even if we will have large amount of impurities coming from the surrounding. So to c conclude, last year, we had Lou Lee showing to us the magnetism and superconductivity and their coexistence in these materials. This year, I was explaining the origin of the ferromagnetic magnetism and how we, we can explain the coexistence of ferromagnetism and superconductivity. And I'm looking forward to see what we will hear next year. So that is a good opportunity to thank both Jane and Neil for the opportunity to be here and work, and the fact that we can actually have this connection between the experimental work and theoretical work, which just by the discussion, we can have very fruitful uh, achievement in the, in the subject. And thank you for the attention. Thank you, Karen. Uh, questions, please. Yes. Karen, you mentioned that disorder does not destroy this kind of Can you explain why it's robust in disorder? 
I can explain. That is a part that I somehow kept hidden, and that is related to the fact that there is a very important ingredient, which is spin-orbit coupling. And this spin-orbit coupling, that was the main part of our work, to show that this spin-orbit coupling can actually protect the system from the appearance of impurities. Now, usually, the reason why impurities are so effective, so much uh, destroying the FFLO state is that we are trying to cure something which is related to spin by changing momentum. When we have spin-orbit coupling, spin and momentum are coupled. That's why it's called spin-orbit coupling. And therefore, the same way that impurities will affect the momentum, they will also affect the spins and the magnetic field. And therefore, it's way more robust. Krishna. So um, are you expecting, is there an experimental way of actually seeing the spatial modulation? Is there some scattering experiment that you could do that you could see um, the, the periodicity with a longer wavelength than the lattice spacing? OK, so it's not scattering exper experiment, but what somehow similar to scattering experiment in condensed matter will be to do a um, Josephson junction experiment. Since the, F, the fact that we have modulation means that the phase of the superconductor conduct, will depend on space, depend on position. And therefore, if we will try to, to make a Josephson junction between normal superconductor without this modulation and a superconductor with FFLO state with modulation, there will be mismatch of the phase. But we can cure this mismatch, for example, by applying magnetic field. And then see exactly the modulation just from the magnetic field that we apply. I have a question about the sandwich structure that you showed in the, in the electric field and the buildup of the uh, polarity, the polar catastrophe. Uh, if you could arrange things so as to get conducting layers on the external exteriors of a set of these layers, and one of these cascades in the middle, you might have a battery. Is that possible? Um, you mean you want basically to have that both surfaces will contribute to the well, I'm, just, I'm just thinking the polar of, catastrophe. right, exactly. I'd like to be able to run electrons through the whole system and create a, a battery in this way. So it might be possible. The main effect here comes from the fact that you are taking two materials with different polarity, one with neutral and one with charge layers. Right. It might be if you are taking two kind of charge layers that something like that can be done, because as long as the second layer is neutral, then you can only get contribution from the non-neutral, the polar um, material. Well, indeed, and that picture made me think of a lead-zinc battery, uh, which uh, uses a, that general idea of having two uh, materials with different electrochemical properties. But here you could perhaps engineer such a material. It's, just, just it's a, a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, Mark. So uh, you described this um, elegant mechanism for getting the ferromagnetism. Um, uh, but how do you know that the ferromagnetism doesn't come from direct coupling between the localized spins, okay. which is for some reason modified by the charge density? Okay, so there are two ways. If you are looking just at the parent compound, none of them is magnetic. So it doesn't look like itinerant. Still, it might be coming just from direct interaction between the localized electrons electrons, but we were estimating that, and we found that not only that they don't give you ferromagnetic order, they might give you weak anti-ferromagnetic order. So that is the larger effect that is coming from these conducting electrons. Neil. Are you still collaborating with Lully? So, so since Lou left, the, he, he is not measuring that, these systems anymore. But actually, Andrea, I think, starts or want to start to measure them. Andrea Young will just arrive this year as a fellow. Andrea. So is, is the implication of 
this model that if you deplete the system, then the ferromagnetism should go away? Yes. It's enough to deplete the conducting electron. Right. Yes. Yes. How, how do you allow the chance of a spin So, in principle, we know that the mechanism for superconductivity here is most probably from phonons. That is because already in the parent compound, you can get superconductivity, which is phonon mediated. And yet, if we have from the same mechanism once singlet pairing and once triplet pairing, there should be a difference in magnitude between them. And here it's the same magnitude for superconductivity if we just take strontium titanate and dope it, or when we are looking at the interface. So it's most probably not going to be triplet one, but it's not that we rule that completely. Okay, let's thank Karen again. Thanks.